Chapter Seventeen of Red Money by Fergus Hume. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. On the Trail. Great was the excitement in society when it became known through the medium of a newspaper paragraph that lady agnes pine had surrendered two millions sterling to become mrs noel lambert some romantic people praised her as a noble woman who placed love above mere money while others loudly declared her to be a superlative fool but one and all agreed that she must have loved her cousin all the time and that clearly the marriage with the deceased millionaire had been forced on by garvington for family reasons connected with the poverty of the lamberts it was believed that the fat little egotist had obtained his price for selling his sister and that his estates had been freed from all claims through the generosity of pine of course this was not the case but the fact was unknown to the general public and garvington was credited with an income which he did not possess the man himself was furious at having been tricked he put it in this way quite oblivious to his own actions which had brought about such a result he could not plead ignorance on this score as agnes had written him a letter announcing her marriage and plainly stating her reasons for giving up her late husband's fortune she ironically advised him to seek out the person to whom the money would pass and to see if he could not plunder that individual garvington angry as he was took the advice seriously and sought out jarwin but that astute individual declined to satisfy his curiosity guessing what use he would make of the information in due time as the solicitor said the name of the lucky legatee would be made public and with this assurance garvington was obliged to be content meanwhile the happy pair and they truly were extremely happy heard nothing of the chatter and were indifferent to either praise or blame they were all in all to one another and lived in a kind of paradise on the south coast of devonshire on one of his sketching tours lambert had discovered a picturesque old world village tucked away in a fold of the moorlands and hither he brought his wife for the golden hours of the honeymoon they lived at the small inn and were attended to by a gigantic landlady who made them very comfortable mrs anak as noel called her took the young couple for poor but artistic people since agnes had dropped her title as unsuited to her new humble position and in the colonies she explained to her husband during a moorland ramble it would be absurd for me to be called my lady mrs noel lambert is good enough for me quite so dear if we ever do go to the colonies we must know as we have so little to live on oh one thousand a year isn't so bad he answered good-humouredly it may seem poverty to you who have been used to millions my darling but all my life i have been hard up and i am thankful for twenty pounds a week you speak as though i had been wealthy all my life noel but remember that i was as hard up as you before i married hubert poor soul then dear you must appreciate the fact that we can never starve besides i hope to make a name as a painter in the colonies why not art is to be found there as in england change of scene does not destroy any talent one may possess but i am not so sure darling if it is wise to leave england at least until we learn who murdered pine oh my dear do let us leave that vexed question alone the truth will never become known it must become known agnes said lambert firmly remember that silver and chaldea practically accuse us of murdering your husband they know it is a lie and won't proceed further said agnes hopefully oh yes they will and miss greeby also clara why she is on our side indeed she is not your guess that she was still in love with me turns out to be quite correct i received a letter from her this morning which was forwarded from kensington she reproaches me for marrying you after the trouble she took in getting the forged letter back from silver 
but you told me that she said she would help you as a friend she did so in order to use an expressive phrase to pull the wool over my eyes but she intended and she puts her intention plainly in her letter to help me in order to secure my gratitude and then she counted upon my making her my wife agnes flushed i might have guessed that she would act in that way when you told me she was helping i had a suspicion what she was aiming at what else does she say oh all manner of things more or less silly she hints that i have acted meanly in causing you to forfeit two millions and says that no man of honor would act in such a way i see said mrs lambert coolly she believed that my possession of the money would be even a greater barrier to our coming together than the fact of my being married to hubert well dear what does it matter a great deal agnes replied noel wrinkling his brows she intends to make mischief and she can with the aid of silver who is naturally furious at having lost his chance of blackmail then there's chaldea she can do nothing she can join forces with miss greeby and the secretary and they will do their best to get us into trouble to defend ourselves we should have to explain that garvington wrote the letter and then heaven only knows what disgrace would befall the name but you don't believe that freddy is guilty asked agnes anxiously oh no still he wrote that letter which lured pine to his death and if such a mean act became known he would be disgraced for ever freddy has such criminal instincts said mrs lambert gloomily that i am quite sure he will sooner or later stand in the dock we must keep him out of it as long as we can said noel decisively for that reason i intend to leave you here and go to garvington to see freddy yes and to see chaldea and to call on silver who is living in my old cottage also i wish to have a conversation with miss greeby in some way my dear i must settle these people or they will make trouble have you noticed agnes what a number of gypsies seem to cross our path yes but there are many gypsies in devonshire no doubt but many gypsies do not come to this retired spot as a rule and yet they seem to swarm chaldea is having us watched for what reason agnes opened her astonished eyes i wish to learn chaldea is now a queen and evidently has sent instructions to her kinsfolk in this county to keep an eye on us agnes ruminated for a few minutes i met mother cockleshell yesterday she observed but i thought nothing of it as she belongs to devonshire i believe mother cockleshell is on our side dear since she is so grateful to you for looking after her when she was sick but cara has been hovering about and we know that he is chaldea's lover then said mrs lambert rising from the heather on which they had seated themselves it will be best to face mother cockleshell and cara in order to learn what all this spying means lambert approved of this suggestion and the two returned to mrs anak's abode to watch for the gypsies but although they saw two or three or even more during the next few days they did not set eyes on the servian dwarf or on gentilla stanley then since it never rains but it pours the two came together to the inn agnes saw them through the sitting-room window and walked out boldly to confront them noel was absent at the moment so she had to conduct the examination entirely alone gentilla why are you spying on me and my husband asked agnes abruptly the respectable woman dropped a curtsey and clutched the shoulder of Kara, who showed a disposition to run away i'm no spy my angel said the old creature with a cunning glint in her eyes it's this one who keeps watch for what reason bless you my lady don't call me by my title i've dropped it only for a time my dear 
i have read your fortune in the stars my Giorgio one and higher you will be with money and rank than ever you have been in past days but not with the child's approval the child what child chaldea no less she's raging mad as the golden rye has made you his rami my sweet one and she has set many besides kara to overlook you so mr lambert and i thought and chaldea's reason she would make trouble replied mother cockleshell mysteriously but kara does not wish her to love the golden rye as she still does since he would have the child to himself she turned and spoke rapidly in romney to the small man in the faded green coat kara listened with twinkling eyes and pulling at his heavy beard with one hand while he held the neck of his violin with the other when mother cockleshell ceased he poured out a flood of callow jib with much gesticulation and in a voice which boomed like a gong of course mrs lambert did not understand a word of his speech and looked inquiringly at gentilla kara says translated the woman hurriedly that he is your friend since he is glad that you are the golden rise romi ever since you left lundra the child has set him and others to spy on you she makes mischief does the child in her witchy way ask him said agnes indicating the dwarf if he knows who murdered my late husband gentilla asked the question and translated the reply he knows nothing but the child knows much i go back to the wood in hendenshire my dear to bring about much that will astonish chaldea curses on her evil heart tell the rye to meet me at his old cottage in a week then the wrong will be made right ended mother cockleshell speaking quite in the style of meg merrily's and very grandiloquently and happiness will be yours by this and this i bless you my precious lady making several mystical signs she turned away forcing the reluctant cara to follow her but gentilla agnes hurried in pursuit no no my georgios it is not the time seven days and seven hours and seven minutes will hear the striking of the moment surishan my dearie mother cockleshell hobbled away with surprising alacrity and mrs lambert returned thoughtfully to the inn evidently the old woman knew of something which would solve the mystery else she would scarcely have asked noel to meet her in hendenshire and being an enemy to chaldea who had deposed her agnes was quite sure that gentilla would work her hardest to thwart the younger gypsy's plans it flashed across her mind that chaldea herself might have murdered pine but since his death would have removed the barrier between lambert and herself agnes could not believe that chaldea was guilty the affair seemed to become more involved every time it was looked into however mrs lambert related to her husband that same evening all that had taken place and duly delivered the old gypsy's message noel listened quietly and nodded he made up his mind to keep the appointment in abbot's wood the moment he received the intelligence and you can stay here agnes he said no no she pleaded i wish to be beside you there may be danger my dear chaldea will not stick at a trifle to revenge herself you know all the more reason that i should be with you insisted agnes besides these wretches are plotting against me as much as against you so it is only fair that i should be on the spot to defend myself you have a husband to defend you now agnes still as i know you will be anxious if i leave you in this out-of-the-way place it will be best for us both to go to london there is a telephone at wanbury and i can communicate with you at once should it be necessary of course it will be necessary said mrs lambert with fond impatience i shall worry dreadfully to think that you are in danger i don't wish to lose you now that we are together you can depend upon my keeping out of danger for your sake dear said the young man caressing her 
moreover mother cockleshell will look after me should chaldea try any of her romney tricks stay in town darling oh dear me that flat is so dingy and lonely and disagreeable you shan't remain at the flat there's a very pleasant hotel near hyde park where we can put up it's so expensive never mind the expense just now when everything is square we can consider economy but i shall not be easy in my mind until poor pine's murderer is in custody i only hope garvington won't be found to be an accomplice said agnes with a shiver bad as he is i can't help remembering that he is my brother and head of the lamberts added her husband gravely you may be sure that i shall try and save the name from disgrace it's a dismal ending to our honeymoon let us look upon it as the last hedge of trouble which has to be jumped agnes laughed at this quaint way of putting things and cheered up for the next few days they did their best to enjoy the full golden hours of love and peace which remained and then departed to the unframed regret of mrs anak but present pleasure meant future trouble so the happy pair and they were very happy in spite of the lowering clouds were forced to leave their temporary paradise in order to baffle their enemies miss greeby chaldea silver and perhaps garvington were all arrayed against them so a conflict could not possibly be avoided agnes took up her abode in the private hotel near the park which lambert had referred to and was very comfortable although she did not enjoy that luxury with which pine's care had formerly surrounded her having seen that she had all she required noel took the train to wanbury and thence drove in a hired fly to garvington where he put up at the village inn it was late at night when he arrived so it might have been expected that few would have noted his coming this was true but among the few was chaldea who still camped with her tribe in abbot's wood whosoever now owned the property on mortgage evidently did not desire to send the gypsies packing and of course garvington not having the power could not do so thus it happened that while lambert was breakfasting next morning somewhere about ten o'clock word was brought to him by the landlady that a gypsy wished to see him the young man at once thought that mother cockleshell had called to adjust the situation and gave orders that she should be admitted he was startled and ill-pleased when chaldea made her appearance she looked as handsome as ever but her face wore a sullen vicious look which augured ill for a peaceful interview so you cheated me after all rye was her greeting and her eyes sparkled with anger at the sight of the man she had lost don't be a fool girl said lambert purposely rough for her persistence irritated him you know that i never loved you am i so ugly then demanded the girl bitterly that remark is beside the point said the man coldly and i am not going to discuss such things with you but i should like to know why you set spies on me when i was in devonshire chaldea's eyes sparkled still more and she taunted him oh the clever one that you are to know that i had you watched ay and i did my rye from the time you left the cottage you were under the looks of my people why may i ask because i want revenge cried chaldea stepping forward and striking so hard a blow on the table that the dishes jumped you scorned me and now you shall pay for that scorn don't be melodramatic please what can you do to harm me i should like to know you silly creature i can prove that you murdered my brother hearn oh can you and in what way i have the bullet which killed him said the gypsy speaking very fast so to prevent interruption kara knifed it out of the tree trunk which grows near the shrubbery if i take it to the police and it fits your pistol then where will you be my precious cheat lambert looked at her thoughtfully 
If she really did possess the bullet, he would be able to learn if Garvington had fired the second shot, since it would fit the barrel of his revolver. So far as he was concerned, when coming to live in Abbot's Wood Cottage, he had left all his weapons stored in London, and would be able to prove that such was the case. He did not fear for himself, as Chaldea's malice could not hurt him in this way, but he wondered if it would be wise to take her to the manor, where Garvington was in residence, in order to test the fitting of the bullet. Finally he decided to risk doing so as in this way he might be able to force the girl's hand and learn how much she really knew. If aware that Garvington was the culprit, she would exhibit no surprise did the bullet fit the barrel of that gentleman's revolver, and should it be proved that she knew the truth, she would not dare to say anything to the police, lest she should be brought into the matter as an accomplice after the fact. Chaldea misunderstood his silence while he was thinking in this way, and smiled mockingly with a toss of her head. "'Ah, the rye is afraid. His sin has come home to him,' she sneered. "'Ay, you are at my feet now, my Georgios one.' "'I think not,' said Lambert coolly, and rose to put on his cap. "'Come with me, Chaldea. We go to the manor.' "'And what would I do in the Boro Rye's kin, my precious?' Lambert ignored the question. "'Have you the bullet with you?' Avila, Chaldea nodded. It lies in my pocket. Then we shall see at the manor if it fits the pistol. Ay, you have left the shooter at the big house, said the girl, falling into the trap, and thereby proved, to Lambert at least, that she was really in the dark as regards the true criminal. Lord Garvington has a revolver of mine, said the young man evasively, although the remark was a true one since he had presented his cousin with a brace of revolvers some twelve months before. Chaldea looked at him doubtfully. And if the bullet fits, then you can do what you like, retorted Lambert tartly. Come on, I can't wait here all day listening to the rubbish you talk. The gypsy followed him sullenly enough, being overborne by his peremptory manner and anxious, if possible, to bring home the crime to him. What she could not understand, for all her cleverness, was why he should be so eager to condemn himself, and so went to the manor on the lookout for treachery. Chaldea always judged other people by herself, and looked upon treachery as quite necessary on certain occasions. Had she guessed the kind of trap which Lambert was laying for her, it is questionable if she would have fallen into it so easily. And Lambert, even at this late hour, could not be certain if she really regarded him as guilty, or if she was only bluffing in order to gain her ends. Needless to say, Garvington did not welcome his cousin enthusiastically when he entered the library to find him waiting with Chaldea beside him. The fat little man rushed in like a whirlwind, and ignoring his own shady behavior, heaped reproaches on Lambert's head. I wonder you have the cheek to come here, he raged. You and this beast of a girl. I want no gypsies in my house, I can tell you. And you've lost me a fortune by your selfish behavior. I don't think we need to talk of selfishness when you are present, Garvington. Why not? By marrying Agnes you have made her give up the money. She wished to give it up to punish you, said Lambert, rebukingly. To punish me? Garvington's gooseberry eyes nearly fell out of his head. And what have I done? Lambert laughed and shrugged his shoulders. In the face of this dense egotism, it was impossible to argue in any way. He dismissed the subject and got to business, as he did not wish to remain longer in Garvington's society than was absolutely necessary. This girl, he said abruptly, indicating Chaldea, who stood passively at his elbow, has found the bullet with which Pine was shot. Kara found it, my Boro Rye, put in the gypsy quickly, and addressing Lord Garvington, who gurgled out his surprises, in a tree trunk. Ah, yes, interrupted the other, the elm which is near the shrubbery. Then why didn't you give the bullet to the police? Do you ask that, Garvington? inquired Lambert meaningly. 
and the little man whirled round to answer with an expression of innocent surprise of course i do he vociferated growing purple with resentment you don't accuse me of murdering the man who was so useful to me i hope i shall answer that very leading question when you bring out the revolver with which you shot pine on that night i only winged him cried garvington indignantly the second shot was fired by some unknown person as was proved clearly enough at the inquest all the same i wish you to produce the revolver why the host looked suspicious and even anxious it was chaldea who replied and when doing so she fished out the battered bullet to see if this fits the barrel of the pistol which the golden rye gave you my great one said she significantly garvington started his color changed and he stole a queer look at the impassive face of his cousin the pistol which the golden rye gave me he repeated slowly and weighing the words did you give me one no i gave you a couple in a case answered lambert without mentioning the date of the present and if this bullet fits the one you used it will prove nothing interrupted the other hurriedly and with a restless movement i fired from the doorstep and my bullet after breaking pine's arm must have vanished into the beyond the shot which killed him was fired from the shrubbery and it is quite easy to guess how it passed through him and buried itself in the tree which was in the line of fire i want to see the pistols said lambert insistently and this time chaldea looked at him wondering why he was so anxious to condemn himself oh very well snapped garvington with some reluctance and walked toward the door there he paused and evidently awaited to arrive at some conclusion the nature of which his cousin could not guess oh very well he said again and left the room he thinks that you are a fool as i do my georgius said chaldea scornfully you wish to hang yourself it seems my rye oh i don't think i shall be the one to be hanged tell me chaldea do you really believe that i am guilty Yes said the girl positively and if you had married me i should have saved you lambert laughed but was saved the trouble of a reply by the return of garvington who trotted in to lay a mahogany case on the table opening this he took out a small revolver of beautiful workmanship chaldea desperately anxious to bring home the crime to lambert hastily snatched the weapon from the little man's hand and slipped the bullet into one of the chambers it fitted making allowance for its battered condition precisely she uttered a cry of triumph so you did shoot the romney my bold one was her victorious speech because the bullet fits the barrel of a revolver i gave to my cousin some twelve months ago he inquired smiling chaldea's face fell twelve months ago she echoed greatly disappointed yes as lord garvington can swear to so i could not have used the weapon on that night you see i used it admitted garvington readily enough and winged pine exactly but i gave you a brace of revolvers of the same make the bullet which would fit one as it does would fit the other i see there is only one in the case where is the other garvington's color changed and he shuffled with his feet i lent it to silver he said in a low voice and reluctantly was it in silver's possession on the night pine was shot must have been he borrowed it a week before because he feared burglars then said lambert coolly and drawing a breath of relief for the tension had been great the interference is obvious silver shot hubert pine end of chapter seventeen chapter eighteen of red money by fergus hume this levervox recording is in the public domain chapter eighteen an amazing accusation bing in tutis bunto 
swore chaldea in good romney meaning that she wished the devil was in someone's body and she heartily meant what she said and cared little which of the two men's interior was occupied by the enemy of mankind since she hated both the girl was disappointed to think that lambert should escape from her snare and enraged that garvington's production of one revolver and his confession that silver had the other tended to this end may the pair of you burn in hell she cried taking to english so that they could understand the insult ashes may you be in the crooked one's furnace lambert shrugged his shoulders as he quite understood her feelings and did not intend to lower himself by correcting her he addressed himself to his cousin and turned his back on the gypsy silver shot hubert pine he repeated with his eyes on garvington's craven face it's impossible impossible returned the other hurriedly silver was shut up in the house with the rest i saw to the windows and doors myself along with the butler and footman at the inquest never mind about the inquest i know what you said there and i am now beginning to see why you said it what the devil do you mean i mean stated the other staring hard at him that you knew silver was guilty when the inquest took place and screened him for some reason i didn't know i swear i didn't know stuttered garvington wiping his heated face and with his lower lip trembling you must have done so replied lambert restlessly this bullet will fit both the revolvers i gave you and as you passed on one to silver rubbish bosh nonsense babbled the little man incoherently until you brought the bullet i never knew that it would fit the revolver this was true as lambert admitted however he saw that garvington was afraid for some reason and pressed his advantage now that you see how it fits you must be aware that it could only have been fired from the revolver which you gave silver i don't see that protested garvington that bullet may fit many revolvers lambert shook his head i don't think so i had that brace of revolvers especially manufactured and the make is peculiar i am quite prepared to swear that the bullet would fit no other weapon and and he hesitated then faced the girl who lingered sullen and disappointed you can go chaldea said lambert pointing to the french window of the library which was wide open the gypsy sauntered toward it clutching her shawl and gritting her white teeth together oh i go my ways my rye but i have not done with you yet may the big devil rack my bones if i have you win to-day i win to-morrow and so good day to you and curses on you for a bad one the devil is a nice character and that's you she screamed beside herself with rage the poor old thing is a fino mush if you will have the gallo jib and with a wild cry worthy of a banshee she disappeared and was seen running unsteadily across the lawn lambert shrugged his shoulders again and turned to his miserable cousin who had sat down with a dogged look on his fat face i have got rid of her because i wish to save the family name from disgrace said lambert quietly there is no disgrace on my part remember to whom you are speaking i do i speak to the head of the family worse luck you have done your best to trail our name in the mud you altered a check which pine gave you so as to get more money you forged his name to a mortgage lies lies the lies of agnes screamed garvington jumping up and shaking his fist in puny anger the wicked speak properly of my wife or i'll wring your neck said lambert sharply as to what she told me being lies it is only too true as you know i read the letter you wrote confessing that you lured pine here to be shot by telling falsehoods about agnes and me i only lured him to get his arm broken so that i might nurse him when he was ill and get some money growled garvington sitting down again i am well aware of what you did and how you did it but you gave that forged letter to silver so that it might be passed on to pine 
I didn't. I didn't. I didn't. I didn't. You did, and because Silver knew too much, you gave him the Abbot's Wood Cottage at a cheap rent, or at no rent at all, for all I know. To be quite plain, Garvington, you conspired with Silver to have Pine killed. Winged, only winged, I tell you. I never shot him. Your accomplice did. He's not my accomplice. He was in the house. Everything was locked up. By you, said Lambert quickly. So it was easy for you to leave a window unfastened, so that Silver might get outside to hide in the shrubbery. Oh! Garvington jumped up again, looking both pale and wicked. You want to put a rope around my neck, curse you! That's a melodramatic speech, which is not true, replied the other coldly, for I want to save you, or rather our name, from disgrace. I won't call in the police. Garvington winced at this word, because I wish to hush the matter up. But since Chaldea and Silver accuse me, and accuse Agnes of getting rid of Pine so that we might marry, it is necessary that I should learn the exact truth. I don't know it. I know nothing more than I have confessed. You are such a liar that I can't believe you. However, I shall go at once to Silver, and you shall come with me. I shan't. Garvington, who was overfed and flabby and unable to hold his own against a determined man, settled himself in his chair and looked as obstinate as a battery mule. Oh, yes, you will, you little swine, said Lambert, freezingly cold. How dare you call me names? Names? If I called you those you deserved, I should have to annex the vocabulary of a Texan mule driver. How such a beast as you ever got into our family I can't conceive. I am the head of the family, and I order you to leave the room. Oh, you do, do you? Very good. Then I go straight to Vanbury, and shall tell what I have discovered to Inspector Darby. No, 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 no! Garvington cornered at last, sprang from his chair, and made for his cousin with unsteady legs. It might be unpleasant. I dare say to you. Well, will you come with me to Abbot's Wood? Yes, whimpered Garvington. Wait till I get my cap and stick. Curse you for an interfering beast. You don't know what you're doing. Ah, then you do know something likely to reveal the truth. I don't. I swear I don't. I only— Oh, damn you, get your cap and let us be off, broke in Lambert angrily for I can't be here all day listening to your lies. Garvington scowled and ambled out of the room, closely followed by his cousin, who did not think it wise to lose sight of so shifty a person. In a few minutes they were out of the house and took the path leading from the blue door to the postern gate in the brick wall surrounding the park. It was a frosty sunny day with a hard blue sky, overarching a wintry landscape. A slight fall of snow had powdered the ground with a film of white, and the men's feet drummed loudly on the iron earth, which was in the grip of the frost. Garvington complained of the cold, although he had on a fur overcoat which made him look like a baby bear. "'You'll give me my death of cold dragging me out like this,' he moaned as he trotted beside his cousin. "'I believe you want me to take pneumonia so that I may die and leave you the title.' I should at least respect it more than you do, said Lambert with scorn. Why can't you be a man instead of a thing on two legs? If you did die, no one would miss you but cooks and provision dealers. Garvington gave him a vicious glance from his little pig's eyes, and longed to be tall and strong and daring, so that he might knock him down. But he knew that Lambert was muscular and dexterous, and would probably break his neck if it came to a tussle. Therefore, as the stout little lord had a great regard for his neck, he judged it best to yield to superior force, and trotted along obediently enough. Also, he became aware within himself that it would be necessary to explain to Silver how he had come to betray him, and that would not be easy. Silver would be certain to make himself extremely disagreeable. Altogether the walk was not a pleasant one for the Siburite. 
the abbot's wood looked bare and lean with the leaves stripped from its many trees occasionally there was a fir clothed in dark green foliage but for the most part the branches of the trees were naked and quivered constantly in the chilly breeze even on the outskirts of the wood one could see right into the center where the black monoliths they looked black against the snow reared themselves grimly to the right there was a glimpse of gypsy fires and tents and caravans and the sound of the romney tongue was borne toward them through the clear atmosphere on such a day it was easy both to see and hear for long distances and for this reason chaldea became aware that the two men were walking toward the cottage the girl desperately angry that she had been unable to bring lambert to book had sauntered back to the camp but had just reached it when she caught sight of the tall figure and the short one in a moment she knew that lambert and his cousin were making for silver's abode which was just what she expected them to do at once she determined to again adopt her former tactics which had been successful in enabling her to overhear the conversation between lambert and lady agnes and following at a respectable distance she waited for her chance it came when the pair entered the cottage for then chaldea ran swiftly in a circle toward the monoliths and crouched down behind one while peering from behind this shelter she saw silver pass the window of the studio and felt certain that the interview would take place in that room like a serpent as she was the girl crawled and wiggled through the frozen vegetation and finally managed to get under the window without being observed the window was closed but by pressing her ear close to the woodwork she was enabled to hear a great deal if not all candidly speaking chaldea had truly believed that lambert had shot pine but now that he had disproved the charge so easily she became desperately anxious to learn the truth lambert had escaped her but she thought that it might be possible to implicate his wife in the crime which would serve her purpose of injuring him just as well silver was not surprised to see his landlord as it seemed that garvington paid him frequent visits but he certainly showed an uneasy amazement when lambert stalked in behind the fat little man silver was also small and also cowardly and also not quite at rest in his conscience so he shivered when he met the very direct gaze of his unwelcome visitor you have come to look at your old house mr lambert he remarked when the two made themselves comfortable by the studio fire not at all i have come to see you was the grim response that is an unexpected honor said silver uneasily and his eyes sought those of lord garvington who was spreading out his hands to the blaze looking blue with cold he caught silver's inquiring look i couldn't help it said garvington crossly i must look after myself silver's smooth foxy face became livid and he could scarcely speak when he did it was with a sickly smile whatever are you talking about my lord oh you know damn you i did give you that revolver you know the revolver silver stared yes why should i deny it i suppose you have come to get it back i have come to get it mr silver put in lambert politely hand it over to me if you please if you like it certainly has your name on the handle said the secretary so quietly that the other man was puzzled silver did not seem to be so uncomfortable as he might have been the revolver was one of a pair which i had especially made when i went to africa some years ago explained lambert elaborately and determined to make his listener understand the situation thoroughly on my return i made them a present to my cousin i understand mr silver that lord garvington lent you one and kept the other interrupted the man sharply that is true i was afraid of burglars since lord garvington was always talking about them so i asked him to lend me a weapon to defend myself with and you used it to shoot pine snapped garvington anxious to end his suspense and get the interview over as speedily as possible 
silver rose from his seat in an automatic manner and turned delicately pale are you mad he gasped looking from one man to the other it's all very well you talking whimpered garvington with a shiver but pine was shot with that revolver i lent you it's a lie oh i knew you'd say that complained garvington shivering again but i warned you that there might be trouble since you carried that letter for me so that it might fall by chance into pine's hands ugh groaned silver sinking back into his chair and passing his tongue over a pair of dry gray lips hold your tongue my lord what's the use he knows and garvington jerked his head in the direction of his cousin the game's up silver the game's up oh silver's eyes flashed and he looked like a rat at bay so you intend to save yourself at my expense but it won't do my lord you wrote that letter if i carried it to the camp i have admitted to my sister and to lambert here that i wrote the letter silver i had to or get into trouble with the police since neither of them will listen to reason but you suggested the plan to get pine winged so that he might be ill in my house and then we could both get money out of him you invented the plot and i only wrote the letter ugh ugh gulped silver unable to speak plainly do you confess the truth of lord garvington's statement inquired lambert suavely and fixing a merciless eye on the trapped fox no that is yes he swings on the same hook as i do indeed then lord garvington was aware that you shot pine i was not i was not screamed the head of the lambert family jumping up and clenching his hands i swear i never knew the truth until you brought the bullet to the library to fit the revolver the the bullet stampered silver whose smooth red hair was almost standing on end from sheer fright yes said lambert addressing him sharply kara under the direction of chaldea found the bullet in the trunk of the elm tree which was in the line of fire she came with me to the manor this morning and we found that it fitted the barrel of lord garvington's revolver at the inquest and on unimpeachable evidence it was proved that he fired only the first shot which disabled pine without killing him the second shot which pierced the man's heart could only have come from the second revolver which was and is in your possession mr silver the bullet found in the tree trunk will fit no other barrel of no other weapon i'm prepared to swear to this silver covered his face with his hands and looked so deadly white that lambert believed he would faint however he pulled himself together and addressed garvington anxiously you know my lord that you locked up the house on that night and that i was indoors yes admitted the other hesitating so far as i knew you certainly were inside it is true no he added catching his cousin's eye even to save myself i must admit that oh you'd admit anything to save yourself retorted his cousin contemptuously and noting the mistake in the wording of the sentence but admitting that silver was within doors doesn't save you so far as i can see there is no need for lord garvington to excuse himself spoke up silver attempting to enlist the little man on his side by defending him it was proved at the inquest as you have admitted mr lambert that he only fired the first shot and you fired the second i never did i was inside and in bed i only came down with the rest of the guests when i heard the firing is that not so my lord yes admitted garvington grudgingly so far as i know you had nothing to do with the second shot silver turned a relieved face toward lambert i shall confess this much sir he said trying to speak calmly and judicially pine treated me badly by taking my toy inventions and by giving me very little money when i was staying at the manor i learned that lord garvington had also been treated badly by pine he said if we could get money that we should go shares i knew that pine was jealous of his wife and that you were at the cottage here so i suggested that as lord garvington could imitate handwriting 
he should forge a letter purporting to come from lady agnes to you saying that she intended to elope on a certain night also i told lord garvington to talk a great deal about shooting burglars so as to give color to his shooting pine it was arranged to shoot him then no it wasn't cried garvington glaring at silver all we wanted to do was to break pine's arm or leg so that he might be laid up in the manor yes that is so said silver feverishly and nodding i fancied and for this reason i suggested the plot that when pine was ill both lord garvington and myself could deal with him in an easier manner also since the business would be left in my hands i hope to take out some money from various investments and share it with lord garvington we never meant that pine should be killed but only reduced to weakness so that we might force him to give us both money a very ingenious plot said lambert grimly and wondering how much of the story was true and then then lord garvington wrote the letter and when seeing pine i gave it to him saying that while keeping watch on his wife as he asked me to said silver with an emphasis which made lambert wince i had intercepted the letter pine was furious as i knew he would be and said he would come to the blue door at the appointed time to prevent the supposed elopement i told lord garvington who was ready and and i went down pretending that pine was a burglar said lord garvington continuing the story in a most shameless manner i opened the door quite expecting to find him there he rushed me believing in his blind haste that i was agnes coming to elope with you i shot him in the arm and he staggered away while i shut the door again whether on finding his mistake and knowing that he had met me instead of agnes he intended to go away i can't say as i was on the wrong side of the door but agnes attracted to the window by the shot declared and you heard her declare it at the inquest no that pine walked rapidly away and was shot just as he came abreast of the shrubbery that's all and quite enough too said lambert savagely you tricky pair of beasts i suppose you hope to implicate me in the crime it wasn't a crime protested silver but only a way to get money by going up to london you certainly delayed what we intended to do since we could not carry out our plan until you returned you did for one night as chaldea who was on the watch for you told us and then we acted did chaldea know of the trap no she knew nothing save that i it was silver who spoke wanted to know about your return she found the letter in pine's tent and really believed that lady agnes had written it and that you had shot pine it was to force you by threats to marry her that she gave the letter to me and she instructed you to show it to the police said lambert between his teeth whereas you tried to blackmail lady agnes i had to make my money somehow said silver insolently pine was dead and lady agnes had the coin you were to share in the twenty five thousand pounds i suppose lambert asked his cousin indignantly no silver blackmailed on his own i hope to get money from agnes in another way as her hard-up brother that is and if oh shut up you make me sick interrupted lambert suppressing a strong desire to choke his cousin you are as bad as silver and silver is as innocent as lord garvington struck in that gentleman whose face was recovering its natural color lambert turned on him sharply i don't agree with that you shot pine silver sprang up with a hysterical cry he had judged like agag that the bitterness of death was past but found that he was not yet safe i did not shoot pine he declared wringing his hands oh why can't you believe me because garvington gave you the second revolver and with that on the evidence of the bullet pine was murdered that might be so but but silver hesitated and shivered and looked round with a hunted expression in his eyes but what you may as well explain to me i shan't i refuse to i am innocent you can't hurt me 
Lambert brushed aside his puny rage. Inspector Darby can. I shall go to Wanbury this evening and tell him all. No, don't do that, cried Garvington, greatly agitated. Think of me. Think of the family. I think of justice. You two beasts aren't fit to be at large. I'm off. And he made for the door. In a moment, Silver was clutching his coat. No, don't, he screamed. I am innocent. Lord Garvington, say that I am innocent. Oh, you, get out of the hole as best you can. I'm in as big a mess as you are, unless Lambert acts decently. Decently, you wicked little devil, said Lambert, scornfully. I only propose to do what any decent man would do. You trapped Pine by means of the letter and Silver shot him. I didn't, I didn't. You had the revolver. I hadn't. I gave it away. I lent it, panted Silver, crying with terror. You lent it? You gave it? You liar! Who to? Silver looked round again for some way of escape, but could see none. To Miss Greeby! She, 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 she shot Pine! I swear she did! End of chapter 18《Chapter 19 of Red Money by Fergus Hume. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. • Chapter 19 Mother Cockleshell It was late in the afternoon when Lambert got back to the village inn, and he felt both tired and bewildered. The examination of Silver had been so long, and what he revealed so amazing, that the young man wished to be alone both to rest and to think over the situation. It was a very perplexing one, as he plainly saw, since, in the light of the new revelations, it seemed almost impossible to preserve the name of the family from disgrace. Seated in his sitting-room, with his legs stretched out and his hands in his pockets, Lambert moodily glared at the carpet, recalling all that had been confessed by the foxy secretary of Miss Greeby that he should accuse her of committing the crime seemed unreasonable. According to Silver, the woman had overheard by chance the scheme to lure Pine to the manor. Knowing that the millionaire was coming to Abbot's Wood, the secretary had propounded the plan to Garvington long before the man's arrival. Hence the constant talk of the host about burglars and his somewhat unnecessary threat to shoot anyone who tried to break into the house. The persistence of this remark had roused Miss Greeby's curiosity, and noting that Silver and his host were frequently in one another's company, she had seized her opportunity to listen. For some time, so cautious were the plotters, she had heard nothing particular, but after her recognition of Hearn as Pine when she visited the gypsy camp, she became aware that these secret talks were connected with his presence. Then a chance remark of Garvington's, he was always loose-tongued, gave her the clue, and by threats of exposure she managed to make Silver confess the whole plot. Far from thwarting it, she agreed to let them carry it out, and promised secrecy, only extracting a promise that she should be advised of the time and place for the trapping of the millionaire. And it was this acquiescence of Mrs. Greeby's which puzzled Lambert. On the face of it, since she was in love with him, it was better for her own private plans that Pine should remain alive, because the marriage placed Agnes beyond his reach. Why, then, should Miss Greeby have removed the barrier, and at the cost of being hanged for murder? Lambert had asked Silver this question, but had obtained no definite answer, since the secretary protested that she had not explained her reason. Jokingly referring to possible burglars, she had borrowed the revolver from Silver, which he had obtained from Garvington, and it was this action which first led the little secretary to suspect her. Afterward, knowing that she had met Pine in Abbot's Wood, he kept a close watch on her every action to see if she intended to take a hand in the game. 
but silver protested that he could see no reason for her doing so and even up to the moment when he confessed to lambert could not conjecture why she had acted in such a manner however it appeared that she was duly informed of the hour when pine would probably arrive to prevent the pretended elopement and also learned that he would be hanging about the blue door when silver retired for the night he watched the door of her bedroom which was in the same wing of the mansion of his own also he occasionally looked out to see if pine had arrived as the window of his room afforded a fair view of the blue door and the shrubbery for over an hour as he told lambert he divided his attention between the passage and the window it was while looking out of the last and after midnight that he saw miss greeby climb out of her room and descend to the ground by means of the ivy which formed a natural ladder her window was no great height from the ground and she was an athletic woman much given to exercise wondering what she intended to do yet afraid because of pine's expected arrival to leave the house silver watched her cautiously she was arrayed in a long black cloak with a hood he said but in the brilliant moonlight he could easily distinguish her gigantic form as she slipped into the shrubbery when pine arrived silver saw him dash at the blue door when it was opened by garvington and saw him fall back after the first shot then he heard the shutting of the door immediately afterward the opening of lady agnes's window and noted that pine ran quickly and unsteadily down the path as he passed the shrubbery the second shot came at this point silver simply gave the same description as lady agnes did at the inquest and then pine fell afterward garvington and his guests came out and gathered round the body but miss greeby slipping along the rear of the shrubbery doubled back to the shadow at the corner of the house silver having to play his part did not wait to see her re-enter the mansion but presumed she did so by clambering up the ivy he ran down and mingled with the guests and servants who were clustered round the dead man and finally found miss greeby at his elbow artlessly inquiring what had happened for the time being he accepted her innocent attitude later on when dismissed by jarwin and in want of funds he sought out miss greeby and accused her at first she denied the story but finally as she judged that he could bring home the crime to her she compromised with him by giving him the post of her secretary at a good salary when he obtained the forged letter from chaldea and she learned this from lambert when he was ill miss greeby made him give it to her alleging that by showing it to agnes she could the more positively part the widow from her lover miss greeby knowing who had written the letter counted upon agnes guessing the truth and had she not seen that it had entered her mind when the letter was brought to her she would have given a hint as to the forger's name but agnes's hesitation and sudden paleness assured miss greeby that she had guessed the truth so the letter was left to work its poison silver of course clamored for his blackmail but miss greeby promised to recompense him and also threatened if he did not hold his tongue that she would accuse him and garvington of the murder since the latter had forged the letter and the former had borrowed the revolver which had killed pine it would have been tolerably easy for miss greeby to substantiate her accusation as to her share in the crime all she had to do was deny that silver had passed the borrowed revolver on to her and there was no way in which he could prove that he had done so on the whole silver had judged it best to fall in with miss greeby's plans and preserve silence especially as she was rich and could supply him with whatever money he chose to ask for she was in his power and he was in her power so it was necessary to act on the golden rule of give and take and the final statement which silver made to lambert intimated that garvington was ignorant of the truth until the bullet was produced in the library to fit the revolver 
it had never struck garvington that the other weapon had been used to kill pine and he had honestly believed that silver as was actually the case had remained in his bedroom all the time until he came downstairs to play his part as to miss greeby being concerned in the matter such an idea had never entered garvington's head the little man's hesitation in producing the revolver when he got an inkling of the truth was due to his dread that if silver was accused of the murder and at the time it seemed as though the secretary was guilty he might turn king's evidence to save his neck and explain the very shady plot in which garvington had been engaged but lambert had forced his cousin's hand and silver had been brought to book with the result that the young man now sat in his room at the inn quite convinced that miss greeby was guilty yet wondering what motive had led her to act in such a murderous way also lambert wondered what was best to be done in order to save the family name if he went to the police and had miss greeby arrested the truth of garvington's shady dealings would certainly come to light especially as silver was an accessory after the fact on the other hand if he left things as they were there was always a chance that hints might be thrown out by chaldea who had everything to gain and nothing to lose that he and agnes were responsible for the death of pine of course lambert not knowing that chaldea had been listening to the conversation in the cottage believed that the girl was ignorant of the true state of affairs and he wondered how he could inform her that the actual criminal was known without risking her malignity he wanted to clear his character and that of his wife likewise he wished to save the family name but it seemed to him that the issue of these things lay in the hands of chaldea and she was bent upon injuring him if she could it was all very perplexing it was at this point of his meditation that mother cockleshell arrived at the inn he heard her jovial voice outside and judged from its tone that the old dame was in excellent spirits her visit seemed to be a hint from heaven as to what he should do gentilly hated chaldea and loved agnes so lambert felt that she would be able to help him as soon as possible he had her brought into the sitting-room and having made her sit down closed both the door and the window preparatory to telling her all that he had learned the conversation was indeed an important one and he was anxious that it should take place without witnesses you are kind sir said mother cockleshell who had been supplied with a glass of gin and water but it ain't for the likes of me to be sitting down with the likes of you nonsense we must have a long talk and i can't expect you to stand all the time at your age some gentiles ain't so anxious to save the legs of old ones remarked gentilly stanley cheerfully but i always did say as you were a golden one for kindness of heart well them as does what's unexpected gets what they don't hope for i have got my heart's desire mother said lambert sitting down and lighting his pipe i am happy now not as happy as you'd like to be sir said the old woman speaking quite in the gentile manner and looking like a decent charwoman you've a dear wife as i don't deny mr lambert but money is what you want i have enough for my needs not for her needs sir she should be wrapped in cloth of gold and have a path of flowers to tread upon it's a path of thorns just now muttered lambert moodily not for long sir not for long i come to put the crooked straight and to raise a lamp to banish the dark very good this white satin is said mother cockleshell irreverently and alluring to the gin and turbacky goes well with it as there's no denying you wouldn't mind my taking a whiff sir would you and she produced a blackened clay pipe which had seen much service smoking is good for the nerves mr lambert the young man handed her his pouch fill up 
he said, smiling at the idea of his smoking in company with an old gypsy hag. "'Bless you, my precious,' said Mother Cockleshell, accepting the offer with avidity and talking more in the Romney manner. "'I allers did say as you were what I said before you were, and that's golden, my Georgios one. Ah, him!' She blew a wreath of blue smoke from her withered lips. "'That's food to me, my dearie, and heat to my old bones.' Lambert nodded. "'You hinted, in Devonshire, that you had something to say, and a few moments ago you talked about putting the crooked straight.' "'And don't the crooked need that same?' chuckled Gentilly, nodding. "'There's trouble at hand, my gentleman. The child's brewing witch's broth, for sure.' "'Chaldea?' lambert sat up anxiously he mistrusted the younger gypsy greatly and was eager to know what she was now doing ay 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 mother cockleshell nodded three times like a veritable macbeth witch she came tearing rampagiously like to the camp an hour or so back and put on her fine clothes may they cleave with pain to her skin to go to the big city it is true rye Kara ran by the side of the donkey she rode upon. May she have an accident to Wanbury. To Wanbury? Lambert looked startled as it crossed his mind, and not unnaturally, that Chaldea might have gone to inform Inspector Darby about the conversation with Garvington in the library. To Wanbury first, sir, and then to Lundra. How can you be certain of that? "'The child treated me like the devil calls her,' said Gentilly Stanley, shaking her head angrily. "'And I have no trust in her, for a witchy wrong un she is. "'When she goes donkey-wise to Wenbury, I says to a child, says I, quick-like, follow and watch her games. "'So the child runs secret behind hedges, and comes on the child at the railway line making for Lundra and off she goes on wheels in place of tramping the drums in true Romney style. "'What the deuce has she gone to London for?' Lambert asked himself in a low voice. But Gentilly's sharp ears overheard. "'Mischief for sure, my gentleman. Ay, but she's a bad one, that same. But she plays and I play, with the winning for me, since the good cards are always in the old hand.' Fear nothing, my rye, she cannot hurt, though snake that she is, her bite stings. The young man did not reply. He was uneasy in one way, and relieved in another. Chaldea certainly had not gone to see Inspector Darby, so she could not have any intention of bringing the police into the matter. But why had she gone to London? He asked himself this question, and finally put it to the old woman, who watched him with bright, twinkling eyes. "'She's gone for mischief,' answered Gentilla, nodding positively, "'for mischief's as natural to her as cheating is to a Romney chow. "'But I'm a dealer of cards myself, Rye, and I deal myself the best hand.' "'I wish you'd leave metaphor and come to plain speaking,' cried Lambert in an irritable tone, for the conversation was getting on his nerves by reason of its prolixity and indirectness. Mother Cockleshell laughed and nodded, then emptied the ashes out of her pipe and spoke out, irreverently as it would seem. "'The child has taken the hearts of the young from me,' said she, shaking her grizzled head. "'But the old cling to the old.' With them as trust my wisdom, my rye, I goes across the black water to America, and leaves the silly ones to the child. She'll get them into choky and trouble for sure, and that's a true dirkerin. Have you the money to go to America? Money? The old woman chuckled and hugged herself. And why not, sir? When Ishmael Hearn was my child— I, the child of my child, for I am the Bibi of Hearn. Bibi being grandmother in our Romney tongue, sir. Lambert started from his seat, almost too astonished to speak. Do you mean to say that you are Pine's grandmother? Pine? Who is Pine? A Gentile I know not. 
hern he was born and hern he shall be to me though the grass is now a quilt for him oh hon ay ay ah me woe and woe my gentleman he was the child of my child and the love of my heart she rocked herself to and fro sorrowfully like a leaf has he fallen from the tree like the dew has he vanished into the blackness of the great shadow hi my hi my the sadness of it hern your grandson murmured lambert staring at her and scarcely able to believe her true yes it is true said gentilly still rocking he left the road and the tent and the merry fire under a hedge for your gentile life but a born romney he was and no giorgio Arr! she shook herself with disgust why did he labor for gold in the gentile manner when he could have chored and cheated like a true-hearted black one her allusions to money suddenly enlightened the young man yours is the name mentioned in the sealed letter held by jarwin he cried with genuine amazement written largely on his face you inherit the millions Mother Cockleshell wiped her eyes with the corner of her shawl and chuckled complacently. It is so, young man. Therefore can I take those who hold to my wisdom to the great land beyond the water. Ah, uh, I am rich now, sir, and as a Georgius one could I live beneath a roof tree. But for why, I ask you, my golden rye, when I was bred to the open and the sky? In a tent I was born, in a tent I shall die should i go gentile it's longing for the free life i'd be since romney i am and ever shall be as we says in our tongue my dear it's allers the borrow macho that pet ally decree the pandy though true gypsy lingo you can't call it for sure what does it mean demanded lambert staring at the dingy possessor of two million sterling it allers the largest fish that falls back into the water translated mrs stanley i told that to leland the borrow rye and he goes and puts the same into a book for your readings my dearie then she uttered a howl and flung up her arms but what matter i am rich when my child's child's blood calls out for vengeance i'd give all the red gold and red money it is my loved one she added fixing a bright pair of eyes on lambert if i could find him as shot the darling of my heart knowing that he could trust her and pitying her obvious sorrow lambert had no hesitation in revealing the truth so far as he knew it it wasn't a him who shot your grandson but a her ah gentilly flung up her arms again then i was right my old eyes did see a cat in the dark though brightly shone the moon when he fell what you know lambert started back again at this second surprise if it's a gentile lady i know a red one large as a cow in the meadows and fierce as an unbroken colt miss greeby 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 so your romy told me shrieked the old woman throwing up her hands in ecstasy says i to her who's the foxy one and says she smiling like greeby's her name why did you ask my wife that demanded lambert much astonished ah she was no wife of yours then sir why did i ask her because i saw the shooting of pine of hern of your son of who else of who else cried mother cockleshell clapping her skinny hand and paddling on the floor with her feet says ishmael to me Bibi says he my romi is false and would run away with the golden rye this very night as ever was and i says to him it's not so son of my son for your romi is as true as the stars and purer than gold but says he there's a letter he says and shows it to me lies son of my son says i and calls on him to play the trustful rom but he pitches down the letter and says he i go this night to stop them from paddling the hoof and says i to him no no says i 
she's a true one but he goes when all in the camp are sleeping death-like and i watches and i follers and i hides where did you hide never mind dearie i hide securely and sees him walking up and down biting the lips of him and swinging his arms then i sees for oliver was bright and oliver's the moon lovey the big gentile woman come round and hide in the bushes says i to myself says i and what's your game i says not knowing the same till she shoots and my child's child falls dead as a hedgehog then she runs and i run and all is over why didn't you denounce her gentilly and for why my precious heart who would believe the old gypsy rather would the pokey say i'd killed my dear one no no artful am i and patient in abiding my time but the hour strikes as i have said when i spoke to your romney in devonshire no less and the foxy mole shall hang you see my dear i waited for some gentile to speak what i could speak to say as what i saw was truth for sure you speak and now i can tell my tale to the big policeman at wanbury so that my son's son may sleep quiet knowing that the evil has come home to her as laid him low but lovey o oh lovey and my precious one cried the old woman darting forward to caress lambert's hand in a fondling way tell me how you know and what you learned at the cottage you were and maybe out in the open watching the winder of her you loved no said lambert sharply i was at the cottage certainly but in bed and asleep i did not hear of the crime until i was in london in this way i found out the truth mother and he related rapidly all that had been discovered bringing the narrative right up to the confession of silver which he detailed at length the old woman kept her sharp eyes on his expressive face and hugged his hand every now and then as various points in the narrative struck her at the end she dropped his hand and returned back to her chair chuckling it's a sad dirkerin for the foxy lady said gentilly grinning like the witch she was hanged she will be and rightful it is to be so i agree with you replied lambert relentlessly your evidence and that of silver can hang her certainly yet if she is arrested and the whole tale comes out in the newspapers think of the disgrace to my family mother cockleshell nodded that's as true as true my golden rye she said pondering and i wish not to hurt you and the ronnie who was kind to me i go away she rose to her feet briskly and i think what will you do i can't say said lambert doubtfully and irresolutely i must consult my wife miss greeby should certainly suffer for her crime and yet ay 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 the borrow rye she meant garvington is a bad one for sure as we know shame to him is shame to you and i wouldn't have the ronnie miserable the good kind one that she is wait ay wait my precious gentleman and we shall see you will say nothing in the meantime said lambert stopping her at the door and anxious to know exactly what were her intentions i have waited long for vengeance and i can wait longer sir said mother cockleshell becoming less the gypsy and more the respectable alms house widow depend upon my keeping quiet until until what until when never you mind said the woman mysteriously them as sins must suffer for the sin but not you and her as is innocent no violence gentilly said the young man alarmed lest the lawless gypsy nature should punish miss greeby privately i swear there shall be no violence rye wait for the child is making mischief and until we knows of her doings we must be silent give me your gripper my dearie she seized his wrist and bent back the palm of the hand to trace the lines with a dirty finger good fortune comes to you and to her my golden rye she droned in true gypsy fashion money and peace and honor and many children 
to carry on a stainless name your son shall you see and your son's son my noble gentleman and with your romi shall you go with happiness to the grave she dropped the hand so be it for a true durkin and remember gentilly stanley when the luck comes true but mother mother said lambert following her to the door as he was still doubtful as to her intentions concerning miss greeby the gypsy waved him aside solemnly never again will you see me my golden rye if the stars speak truly and if there be virtue in the lines of the hand i came into your life i go out of your life and what is written shall be she made a mystic sign close to his face and then nodded cheerfully duvis stiletti rye was her final greeting and she disappeared swiftly but the young man did not know that the romney farewell meant god bless you end of chapter nineteen Chapter Twenty of Red Money by Fergus Hume. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Twenty, The Destined End. As might have been anticipated, Lord Garvington was in anything but a happy frame of mind. He left Silver in almost a fainting condition and returned to the manor, feeling very sick himself the two cowardly little men had not the necessary plunk of conspirators and now that there seemed to be a very good chance that their nefarious doings would be made public they were both in deadly fear of the consequences silver was in the worst plight since he was well aware that the law would consider him to be an accessory after the fact and that although his neck was not in danger his liberty assuredly was he was so stunned by the storm which had broken so unexpectedly over his head that he had not even the sense to run away all manly grit what he possessed of it had been knocked out of him and he could only whimper over the fire while waiting for lambert to act garvington was not quite so downhearted as he knew that his cousin was anxious to consider the fair fame of the family thinking thus he felt a trifle reassured for the forged letter could not be made public without a slur being cast on the name then again garvington knew that he was innocent of designing pine's death and that even if lambert did inform the police he could not be arrested it is only just to say that had the little man known of miss greeby's intention to murder the millionaire he would never have written the letter which lured the man to his doom and for two reasons in the first place he was too cowardly to risk his neck and in the second pine was of more value to him alive than dead comforting himself with this reflection he managed to maintain a fairly calm demeanor before his wife but on this night lady garvington was particularly exasperating for she constantly asked questions which the husband did not feel inclined to answer having heard that lambert was in the village she wished to know why he had not been asked to stay at the manor and defended the young man when garvington pointed out that an iniquitous person who had robbed agnes of two millions could not be tolerated by the man garvington meant himself he had wronged then jane inquired why lambert had brought chaldea to the house and what had passed in the library but received no answer save a growl finally she insisted that freddie had lost his appetite which was perfectly true and i thought you liked that way of dressing a fish so much dear was her wail i never seemed to quite hit your taste oh bother leave me alone jane i'm worried i know you are for you have eaten so little what is the matter everything's the matter confound your inquisitiveness hasn't agnes lost all her money because of this selfish marriage with noel hang him how the dickens do you expect us to carry on unless we borrow can't you get some money from the person who now inherits jarwin won't tell me the name 
"'But I know who it is,' said Lady Garvington triumphantly. "'One of the servants who went to the gypsy camp this afternoon told my maid, and my maid told me. The gypsies are greatly excited, and no wonder.' Freddy stared at her. "'Excited about what?' why about the money dear don't you know no i don't shouted freddie breaking a glass in his irritation what is it bother you jane don't keep me hanging on in suspense i'm sure i never do freddie dear it's hubert's money which has gone to his mother garvington jumped up who who is his mother he demanded furiously the dear old gentilly stanley what 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 oh freddy said his wife plaintively you make my head ache yes it's quite true celestine had it from william the footman fancy gentilly having all that money how lucky she is oh damn her damn her growled garvington breaking another glass why dear i'm sure she's going to make good use of the money she says so william told celestine that she would give a million to learn for certain who murdered poor hubert would she would she would she jarvington's gooseberry eyes nearly dropped out of his head and he babbled and blurbled and choked and sputtered until his wife was quite alarmed freddie you always eat too fast go and lie down dear yes said garvington rapidly making up his mind to adopt a certain course about which he wished his wife to know nothing i'll lie down jane and don't take any more wine warned jane as she drifted out of the dining-room you are quite red as it is dear but freddy did not take this advice but drank glass after glass until he became pot valiant he needed courage as he intended to go all by himself to the lonely abbot's wood cottage and interview silver it occurred to freddy that if he could induce the secretary to give up miss greeby to justice mother cockleshell out of gratitude might surrender to him the sum of one million pounds of course the old hag might have been talking all round the shop and her offer might be bluff but it was worth taking into consideration garvington thinking that there was no time to lose since his cousin might be beforehand in denouncing the guilty woman hurried on his fur overcoat and after leaving a lying statement with the butler that he had gone to bed he went out by the useful blue door in a few minutes he was trotting along the well-known path making up his mind what to say to silver the interview did not promise to be an easy one i wish i could go without him thought the treacherous little scoundrel as he left his own property and struck across the waste ground beyond the park wall but i can't dash it all since he's the only person who saw the crime actually committed course he'll get jailed as an accessory after the fact but when he comes out i'll give him a thousand or so if the old woman parts at all events i'll see what silver is prepared to do and then i'll call on old cockleshell and make things right with her hang it freddy had a qualmish feeling the exposure won't be pleasant for me over that unlucky letter but if i can snaffle a million it's worth it curse the honor of the family i've got to look after myself somehow ho ho he chuckled as he remembered his cousin what a sell for noel when he finds out that i've taken the wind out of his sails serve him jolly well right in this way garvington kept up his spirits during the walk and felt entirely cheerful and virtuous by the time he reached the cottage in the thin cold moonlight the wintry wood looked spectral and wan the sight of the frowning monoliths the gaunt frozen trees and the snow-powdered earth made the luxurious little man shiver also the anticipated conversation rather daunted him although he decided that after all silver was but a feeble creature who could be easily managed what freddie forgot was that he lacked pluck himself 
and that silver driven into a corner might fight with the courage of despair the sight of the secretary's deadly white and terrified face as he opened the door sufficient to peer out showed that he was at bay if you come in i'll shoot he quavered brokenly i'll i'll brain you with the poker i'll throw hot water on you and and scratch out your your come come said garvington boldly it's only me a friend silver recognized the voice and the dumpy figure of his visitor at once he dragged him into the passage and barred the door quickly breathing hard meanwhile i don't mind you he giggled hysterically you're in the same boat with me my lord but i fancied when you knocked that the police the police his voice died weakly in his throat he cast a wild glance around and touched his neck uneasily as though he already felt the hangman's rope encircling it garvington did not approve of this grim pantomime and swore i'm quite alone damn you he said roughly it's all right so far he sat down and loosened his overcoat for the place was like a turkish bath for heat i want a drink you've been priming yourself i see and he pointed to a decanter of port wine and a bottle of brandy which were on the table along with a tray of glasses silly ass you are to mix i'm i'm keeping up my my spirits giggled silver wholly unnerved and pouring out the brandy with a shaking hand there you are my lord there's water but no soda keeping up your spirits by pouring spirits down said garvington venturing on a weak joke you're in a state of siege too silver certainly was he had bolted the shutters and had piled furniture against the two windows of the room on the table beside the decanter and bottles of brandy lay a poker a heavy club which lambert had brought from africa and had left behind when he gave up the cottage a revolver loaded in all six chambers and a large bread knife apparently the man was in a dangerous state of despair and was ready to give the officers of the law a hostile welcome when they came to arrest him he touched the various weapons feverishly i'll give them beans he said looking fearfully from right to left every door is locked every window is bolted i've heaped up chairs and sofas and tables and chester drawers and wardrobes and mattresses against every opening to keep the devils out and the lamps look at the lamps ugh he shuddered i can't bear to be in the dark plenty of light observed garvington and spoke truly for there must have been at least six lamps in the room two on the table two on the mantelpiece and a couple on the sideboard and amidst his primitive defences sat silver quailing and quivering at every sound occasionally pouring brandy down his throat to keep up his courage the white looks of the man the disorder of the room the glare of the many lights and the real danger of the situation communicated their thrill to garvington he shivered and looked into shadowy corners as silver did then strove to reassure both himself and his companion don't worry so he said sipping his brandy to keep him up to concert pitch i've got an idea which will be good for both of us what is it questioned the secretary cautiously he naturally did not trust the man who had betrayed him do you know who inherited pine's money no the person named in the sealed envelope exactly and the person is mother cockleshell silver was so amazed that he forgot his fright what is gentilly stanley related to pine she's his grandmother it seems one of my servants was at the camp to-day and found the gypsies greatly excited over the old cat's windfall Phew! silver whistled and drew a deep breath if i'd known that i'd have got round the old woman but it's too late now since all the fat is on the fire mr lambert knows too much and you have confessed what should have been kept quiet i had to to save my skin said garvington sullenly after all i had nothing to do with the murder 
i never guessed that you were so mixed up in it until lambert brought that bullet to fit the revolver i lent you and which i gave to miss greeby snapped silver tartly she is the criminal not me what a wax she will be in when she learns the truth i expect your cousin will have her arrested i don't think so he has some silly idea in his head about the honor of our name and won't press matters unless he is forced to who can force him asked silver looking more at ease since he saw a gleam of hope chaldea she's death on making trouble can't we silence her remember you swing on my hook no i don't contradicted garvington sharply i can't be arrested for forging that letter you can not at all i did not write it to lure pine to his death but only wished to maim him that will get you into trouble insisted silver anxious to have a companion in misery it won't i tell you there's no one to prosecute you are the person who is in danger as you knew miss greeby to be guilty and are therefore an accessory after the fact if mr lambert has the honor of your family at heart he will do nothing said the secretary hopefully for if miss greeby is arrested along with me the writing of that letter is bound to come out i don't care it's worth a million what is worth a million the exposure see here silver i hear that mother cockleshell is willing to hand over that sum to the person who finds the murderer of her grandson we know that miss greeby is guilty so why not give her up and earn the money the secretary rose in quivering alarm but i'd be arrested also you said so you know you said so and i say so again remarked garvington leaning back coolly you'd not be hanged you know although she would a few years in prison would be your little lot and when you came out i could give you say er er ten thousand pounds there that's a splendid offer where would you get the ten thousand tell me asked silver with a curious look from the million mother cockleshell would hand over to me for denouncing me for denouncing miss greeby you beast shrieked silver hysterically you know quite well that if she is taken by the police i have no chance of escaping i'd run away now if i had the cash but i haven't i count on your cousin keeping quiet because of your family name and you shan't give the show away but think said garvington persuasively a whole million for you and only ten thousand for me oh i like that well i'll make it twenty thousand no no thirty thousand no 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 forty fifty sixty seventy oh hang it you greedy beast i'll give you one hundred thousand you'll be rich for life then would i curse you silver clenched his fists and backed against the wall looking decidedly dangerous and risk a lifelong sentence to get the money while you take the lion's share you'd only get ten years at most argued the visitor annoyed by what he considered to be silly objections ten years or ten centuries at my time of life you shan't denounce me garvington rose yes i shall he declared rendered desperate by the dread lest he should lose the million i'm going to wanbury tonight to tell inspector darby and get a warrant for miss greeby's arrest along with yours as her accomplice silver flung himself forward and gripped garvington's coat you daren't yes i dare i can't be hurt i didn't murder the man and i'm not going to lose a pile of money for your silly scruples oh my lord consider silver in a panic dropped to his knees i shall be shut up for years it will kill me it will kill me and you don't know what a terrible and clever woman miss greeby is she may deny that i gave her the revolver and i can't prove that i did then i might be accused of the crime and hanged hanged cried the poor wretch miserably oh you'll never give me away my lord will you confound you don't i risk my reputation to get the money raged garvington shaking off the trembling arms which were round his knees 
the truth of the letter will have to come out and then i'm dished so far as society is concerned i wouldn't do it tell that is but that the stakes are so large one million is waiting to be picked up and i'm going to pick it up no 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 silver groveled on the floor and embraced garvington's feet but the more he wailed the more insulting and determined did the visitor become like all tyrants and bullies garvington gained strength and courage from the increased feebleness of his victim don't give me up wept the secretary nearly beside himself with terror don't give me up oh damn you get out of the way said garvington and made for the door i go straight to wanbury which statement was a lie as he first intended to see mother cockleshell at the camp and make certain that the reward was safe but silver believed him and was groined to frenzy you shan't go he screamed leaping to his feet and before garvington knew where he was the secretary had the heavy poker in his grasp the little fat lord gave a cry of terror and dodged the first blow which merely fell on his shoulder but the second alighted on his head and with a moan he dropped to the ground silver flung away the poker are you dead are you dead he gasped kneeling beside garvington and placed his hand on the senseless man's heart it still beat feebly so he arose with a sigh of relief he's only stunned panted silver and staggered unsteadily to the table to seize a glass of brandy i'll ah 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 he shrieked and dropped the tumbler as a loud and continuous knocking came to the front door naturally in his state of panic he believed that the police had actually arrived and here he had struck down lord garvington even though the little man was not dead silver knew that the assault would add to his punishment although he might have concluded that the lesser crime was swallowed up in the greater but he was too terrified to think of doing anything save hiding the stunned man and with a gigantic effort he managed to fling the body behind the sofa then he piled up rugs and cushions between the wall and the back of the sofa until garvington was quite hidden and ran a considerable risk of being suffocated all the time the ominous knocking continued as though the gallows was being constructed at least it seemed so to silver's disturbed fancy and he crept along to the door holding the revolver in an unsteady grip who who is let me in let me in said a loud hard voice i'm miss greeby i have come to save you let me in silver had no hesitation in obeying since she was in as much danger as he was and could not hurt him without hurting herself with trembling fingers he unbolted the door and opened it to find her tall and stately and tremendously impatient on the threshold she stepped in and banged the door to without locking it silver's teeth chattered so much and his limbs trembled so greatly that he could scarcely move or speak on seeing this for there was a lamp in the passage miss greeby picked him up in her big arms like a baby and made for the sitting-room when within she pitched silver on to the sofa behind which garvington lay senseless and placing her arms akimbo surveyed him viciously you infernal worm said miss greeby grim and savage in her looks you have split on me have you how 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 do you know quavered silver mechanically noting that in her long driving coat with a man's cap she looked more masculine than ever how do i know because chaldea was hiding under the studio window this afternoon and overheard all that passed between you and garvington and that meddlesome lambert she knew that i was in danger and came at once to london to tell me since i had given her my address i lost no time but motored down here and dropped her at the camp now i've come to get you out of the country me out of the country stampered the secretary yes you cowardly swine although i'd rather choke the life out of you if it could be done with safety you denounced me you beast i had to 
my own neck was in danger it's in danger now i'd strangle you for two pins but i intend to send you abroad since your evidence is dangerous to me if you are out of the way there's no one else can state that i shot pine here's twenty pounds in gold she thrust a canvas bag into the man's shaking hands get on your coat and cap and i'll take you to the nearest seaport wherever that is my motor is on the verge of the wood you must get on board some ship and sail for the world's end i'll send you more money when you write come come she stammered sharp's the word but 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 miss greeby lifted him off the sofa by the scruff of the neck do you want to be killed she said between her teeth there's no time to be lost chaldea tells me that lambert threatens to have me arrested the prospect of safety and prosperity in a distant land so appealed to silver that he regained his courage in a wonderfully short space of time rising to his feet he hastily drained another glass of brandy and the color came back to his wan cheeks but for all the quantity he had drank that same evening he was not in the least intoxicated he was about to rush out of the room to get his coat and cap when miss greeby laid a heavy hand on his shoulder is there any one else in the house she asked suspiciously silver cast a glance toward the sofa there's no servant he said in a stronger voice i have been cooking and looking after myself since i came here but 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 what you hound she shook him fiercely garvington's behind the sofa garvington miss greeby was on the spot in a moment pulling away the concealing rugs and cushions have you murdered him she demanded drawing a deep breath and looking at the senseless man no he's only stunned i struck him with the poker because he wanted to denounce me quite right miss greeby patted the head of her accomplice as if he were a child you're bolder than i thought go on hurry up before garvington recovers his senses we'll be far enough away denounce me denounce him will you she said looking at garvington while the secretary slipped out of the room you do so at your own cost my lord that forged letter won't tell in your favor ha she started to her feet what's that who's here she might well ask there was a struggle going on in the passage and she heard cries for help miss greeby flung open the sitting-room door and silver embracing mother cockleshell tumbled at her feet she got in by the door you left open cried silver breathlessly hold her or we are lost we'll never get away no you won't shouted the disheveled old woman producing a knife to keep miss greeby at bay chaldea came to the camp and i learned through kara how she'd brought you down my gentile lady i went to tell the golden rye and he's on the way here with a village policeman you're done for not yet miss greeby darted under the uplifted knife and caught gentilly round the waist the next moment the old woman was flung against the wall breathless and broken up but she still contrived to hurl curses at the murderess of her grandson i saw you shoot him i saw you shoot him screamed mother cockleshell trying to rise silver make for the motor it's near the camp follow the path ordered miss greeby breathlessly there's no time to be lost as to this old devil she snatched up a lamp as the secretary dashed out of the house and flung it fairly at gentilly stanley in a moment the old woman was yelling with agony and scrambled to her feet a pillar of fire miss greeby laughed in a taunting manner and hurled another lamp behind the sofa you'd have given me up also would you garvington she cried in her deep tone take that and that and that lamp after lamp was smashed and burst into flames until only one was left then miss greeby seeing with satisfaction that the entire room was on fire and hearing the sound of hasty footsteps and the echoing of distant voices rushed in her turn from the cottage as she bolted 
the voice of garvington screaming with pain and dread was heard as he came to his senses to find himself encircled by fire and mother cockleshell also shrieked not so much because of her agony as to stop miss greeby from escaping rye rye she's running catch her catch her ay -ah, ay -ah, ay -ah. and she sank into the now blazing furnace of the room the walls of the cottage were of mud the partitions and roof of wood and thatch so the whole place soon burned like a bonfire miss greeby shot out of the door and strode at a quick pace across the glade but as she passed beyond the monoliths lambert in company with a policeman made a sudden appearance and blocked her way of escape with a grim determination to thwart him she kilted up her skirts and leaped like a kangaroo towards the undergrowth beneath the leafless trees by this time the flames were shooting through the thatched roof in long scarlet streamers and illuminated the spectral wood with awful light stop stop cried lambert racing to cut off the woman's retreat closely followed by the constable miss greeby laughed scornfully and instead of avoiding them as they crossed her path she darted straight towards the pair in a moment by a dexterous touch of her shoulders right and left she knocked them over by taking them unawares and then sprang down the path which curved toward the gypsies encampment at its end the motor was waiting and so vivid was the light that she saw silver's black figure bending down as he frantically strove to start the machine she traveled at top speed fearful lest the man should escape without her then came an onrush of romney attracted to the glade by the fire they guessed from miss greeby's haste that something was seriously wrong and tried to stop her but delivering blows straight from the shoulder here there and everywhere the woman managed to break through and finally reached the end of the pathway here was the motor and safety since she hoped to make a dash for the nearest seaport and get out of the kingdom before the police authorities could act but the stars in their course fought against her silver having started the machinery was already handling the steering gear and bent only upon saving his own miserable self had put the car in motion he could only drive in a slip-slop amateur way and aimlessly zigzag down the sloping bank which fell away to the high road as the motor began to gather speed miss greeby ran for her life and liberty ranging at length breathlessly alongside the gypsies trailed behind shouting stop you beast screamed miss greeby feeling fear for the first time and she tried to grab the car for the purpose of swinging herself on board but silver urged it to greater speed i save myself myself he shrieked shrilly and unhinged by deadly terror get away get away in his panic he twisted the wheel in the wrong direction and the big machine swerved obediently the next moment miss greeby was knocked down and withered under the wheels she uttered a tragic cry but little silver cared for that rendered merciless with fear he sent the car right over her body and then drove desperately down the hill to gain the hard road miss greeby with a broken back lay on the ground and saw as in a ghastly dream her machine flash roaring along the highway driven by a man who could not manage it even in her pain a smile crept over her pale face he's done for the little beast she muttered he'll smash lambert lambert the man whose name she breathed had arrived as she spoke and knelt breathlessly beside her to raise her head you you oh poor creature he gasped i'm done for lambert she panted in deadly pain back broken i send for you but but you can't hang me look look after garvington cockleshell too look look uh, and she moaned where are they in in the cottage muttered the woman and fell back in a feigning condition with a would-be sneering laugh lambert started to his feet with an oath 
and leaving the wretched woman to the care of some gypsies, ran back to the glade. The cottage was a mass of streaming, crackling flames, and there was no water to extinguish these, as he realized with sudden fear. It was terrible to think that the old woman and Garvington were burning in that furnace, and desperately anxious to save at least one of the two, Lambert tried to enter the door, but the heat of the fire drove him back, and the flames seemed to roar at his discomfiture. He could do nothing but stand helplessly and gaze upon what was plainly Garvington's funeral pyre. By this time the villagers were making for the wood, and the whole place rang with cries of excitement and dismay. The wintry scene was revealed only too clearly by the ruddy glare and by the same sinister light. Lambert suddenly beheld Chaldea at his elbow. Gripping his arm, she spoke harshly. The tiny rye is dead. He drove the engine over the bank, and it smashed him to a pulp. Oh, ah, and, and Miss Greeby? She is dying. Lambert clenched his hands and groaned. Garvington and Mother Cockleshell? She is dead, and he is dead by now, said Chaldea, looking with a callous smile at the burning cottage. Both are dead. Lord Garvington. Lord Garvington? Lambert groaned again. He had forgotten that he now possessed the title and what remained of the family estates. Avila, cried Chaldea, clapping her hands and nodding toward the cottage with a meaning smile. There's the bonfire to celebrate the luck. End of chapter 20《Chapter Twenty One of Red Money by Fergus Hume. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Twenty One A Final Surprise. A week later, and Lambert was seated in the library of the manor, looking worn and anxious. His wan appearance was not due so much to what he had passed through, trying as late events had been as to his dread of what inspector darby was about to say that officer was beside him getting ready for an immediate conversation by turning over various papers which he produced from a large and well-filled pocket-book darby looked complacent and important as an examination into the late tragedy had added greatly to his reputation as a zealous officer things were now more shipshape as Miss Greeby had died after making confession of her crime and had been duly buried by her shocked relatives. The ashes of Lord Garvington and Mother Cockleshell, recovered from the debris of the cottage, had also been disposed of with religious ceremonies, and Silver's broken body had been placed in an unwept grave. The frightful catastrophe, which had resulted in the death of four people, had been the talk of the United Kingdom for the entire seven days. What Lambert was dreading to hear was the report of Miss Greeby's confession, which Inspector Darby had come to talk about. He had tried to see her himself at the village inn, whither she had been transferred to die, but she had refused to let him come to her dying bed and therefore he did not know in what state of mind she had passed away. Judging from the vindictive spirit which she had displayed, Lambert fancied that she had told Darby the whole wretched story of the forged letter and the murder. The last was bound to be confessed, but the young man had hoped against hope that Miss Greeby would be silent regarding Garvington's share in the shameful plot. Wickedly, as his cousin had behaved, Lambert did not wish his memory to be smirked and the family honor to be tarnished by a revelation of the little man's true character. He heartily wished that the evil Garvington had done might be buried with him and the whole sordid affair forgotten. First, my lord, said Darby leisurely, when his papers were in order, I have to congratulate your lordship on your accession to the title. Hitherto so busy have I been that there has been no time to do this. 
thank you mr inspector but i regret that i should have succeeded through so tragic a death yes yes my lord the feeling does you honor darby nodded sympathetically but it must be some comfort for you to know that your poor cousin perished when on an errand of mercy although his aim was not perhaps quite in accordance with strict justice lambert stared i don't know what you mean he remarked being puzzled by this coupling of garvington's name with any good deed of course you don't my lord but for you to understand i had better begin with miss greeby's confession i must touch on some rather intimate things however said the inspector rather shyly meaning that miss greeby was in love with me exactly my lord her love for you if you will excuse my mentioning so private a subject caused the whole catastrophe indeed the young man felt a sense of relief as if darby put the matter in this way the truth about the forged letter could scarcely have come to light will you explain certainly my lord miss greeby always wished to marry your lordship but she knew that you loved your wife the present lady garvington who was then lady agnes pine she believed that you and lady agnes would sooner or later run away together there was no reason she should think so said noel becoming scarlet of course not my lord pardon me again for speaking of such very private matters but i can scarcely make your lordship understand how the late sir hubert pine came by his death unless i am painfully frank go on mr inspector noel leaned back and folded his arms be frank to the verge of rudeness if you like oh no no my lord certainly not darby said in a shocked manner i will be as delicate as i possibly can well then my lord miss greeby thinking that you might elope with the then lady agnes pine resolved to place an even greater barrier between you than the marriage what could be a possibly greater barrier your honor my lord your strict sense of honor miss greeby thought that if she got rid of sir hubert and lady agnes was in possession of the millions that you would never risk her losing the same for your sake she was right in supposing that mr inspector but how did miss greeby know that lady agnes would lose the money if she married me sir hubert told her himself my lord when she discovered that he was at the abbot's wood camp under the name of ishmael hearn his real name of course my lord of course and having made this discovery and knowing how jealous sir hubert was of his wife if you will pardon my mentioning the fact miss greeby laid a trap to lure him to the manor that he might be shot the listener moved uneasily and he now quite expected to hear the revelation of garvington's forgery go on mr inspector miss greeby pursued the officer glancing at his notes knew that the late mark silver who was sir hubert's secretary was not well disposed toward his employer as he fancied that he had been cheated out of the proceeds of certain inventions miss greeby worked on this point and induced silver to forge a letter purporting to come from lady agnes to you saying that an elopement had been arranged oh lambert drew a breath of relief so silver laid a trap did he yes my lord and a very clever one the letter was arranged by silver to fall into sir hubert's hands that unfortunate gentleman came to the blue door at the appointed time then miss greeby who had climbed out of the window of her bedroom to hide in the shrubbery shot the unsuspecting man she then got back into her room and a very clever climber she must have been my lord and afterward mingled with the guests but why did she think of luring sir hubert to be shot asked no with feigned ignorance when she ran such a risk of being discovered ah my lord therein lies the cleverness of the idea poor lord garvington had threatened to shoot any burglar and that gave miss greeby the idea 
it was her hope that your late cousin might kill sir hubert by mistaking him for a robber and she only posted herself in the shrubbery to shoot if sir hubert was not killed he was not as we know that the shot fired by lord garvington only broke his arm miss greeby made sure by killing him herself and very cleverly she did so and what about my late cousin's philanthropic visit to silver ah my lord that was a mistake his lordship was informed of the forged letter by chaldea the gypsy girl who found it in sir hubert's tent and for the sake of your family wished to get silver out of the country it would have been dreadful as lord garvington rightly considered that the name of his sister and your name should be mentioned in connection with an elopement even though it was untrue he therefore went to induce silver to leave the country but the man instead of being grateful stunned his lordship with a blow from a poker which he had picked up how was that known mr inspector miss greeby had the truth from his own lips silver threatened to denounce her and knowing this chaldea went to london to warn her oh muttered lambert thinking of what gentilly stanley had said how did she find out she overheard a conversation between silver and lord garvington in the cottage lambert was relieved again since miss greeby had not evidently mentioned him as being mixed up with the matter yes mr inspector i can guess the rest this unfortunate woman came down to get silver who could have hanged her out of the country and he set fire to the cottage she set fire to it corrected darby quickly by chance as she told me she overturned a lamp of course lord garvington being senseless was burned to death gentilly stanley was also burned how did she come to be there oh it seems that gentilly followed hearn he was her grandson i hear from the gypsies to the manor on that night and saw the shooting but she said nothing not feeling sure if her unsupported testimony would be sufficient to convict miss greeby however she watched that lady and followed her to the cottage to denounce her and prevent the escape of silver who knew the truth also as she ascertained silver knocked the old woman down and stunned her so she also was burned to death then silver ran for the motor car and crushed miss greeby since he could not manage the machine did he crush her on purpose do you think no said darby after a pause i don't think so miss greeby was rich and if the pair of them had escaped silver would have been able to extort money he no more killed her than he killed himself by dashing into that chalk pit near the road it was mismanagement of the motor in both cases lambert was quiet for a time is that all he asked looking up all my lord answered the inspector gathering his papers together is anything else likely to appear in the papers no my lord i noted said lambert slowly that there was no mention of the forged letter made at the inquest darby nodded i arranged that my lord since the forged letter made so free with your lordship's name and that of the present lady garvington as you probably saw it was only stated that the late sir hubert had gone to meet his secretary at the manor and that miss greeby knowing of his coming had shot him the motive was ascribed as anger at the late sir hubert for having lost a great sum of money which miss greeby entrusted to him for the purpose of speculation and is it true that such money was entrusted and lost perfectly true my lord i saw in that fact a chance of hiding the real truth it would do no good to make the forged letter public and would cast discredit both on the dead and the living therefore all that has been said does not even hint at the trap laid by silver now that all parties concerned are dead and buried no more will be heard of the matter and your lordship can sleep in peace the young man walked up and down the room for a few minutes while the inspector made ready to depart 
Noel was deeply touched by the man's consideration, and made up his mind that he should not lose by the delicacy he had shown in preserving his name, and that of Agnes from the tongue of gossips. He saw plainly that Darby was a man he could thoroughly trust, and forthwith did so. "'Mr. Inspector,' he said, coming forward to shake hands, "'you have acted in a most kind and generous manner, and I cannot show my appreciation of your behavior more than by telling you the exact truth of this sad affair.' "'I know the truth.' said darby staring not the exact truth which closely concerns the honor of my family but as you have saved that by suppressing certain evidence it is only right that you should know more than you do know i shall keep quiet anything that you tell me my lord said darby greatly pleased that is anything that is consistent with my official duty of course also i wish you to know exactly how matters stand since there may be trouble with chaldea oh i don't think so my lord chaldea has married that dwarf kara the servian gypsy yes she's given him a bad time and he put up with it because he had no authority over her but now that she's his rami as these people call a wife he'll make her dance to his playing they left england yesterday for foreign parts hungry i fancy my lord the girl won't come back in a hurry for Kara will keep an eye on her lambert drew a long breath of relief i am glad he said simply as i never should have felt safe while she remained in england felt safe echoed the officer suspiciously his host nodded and told the man to take a seat again then without wasting further time he related the real truth about the forged letter darby listened to the recital in amazement and shook his head sadly over the delinquency of the late lord garvington well well said the inspector staring to think as a nobleman born and bred should act in this way why shouldn't a nobleman be wicked as well as the grocer said lambert impatiently and according to the socialistic press all the evil of humanity is to be found in aristocratic circles however you know the exact truth mr inspector and i have confided to you the secret which concerns the honor of my family you won't abuse my confidence darby rose and extended his hand you may be sure of that my lord what you have told me will never be repeated everything in connection with this matter is finished and you will hear no more about it i'm glad and thankful said the other again drawing a breath of relief and to show my appreciation of your services darby i shall send you a substantial check oh my lord i couldn't take it i only did my duty i think you did a great deal more than that answered the new lord garvington dryly and had you acted entirely on the evidence you gathered together and especially on the confession of that miserable woman you might have made public much that i would prefer to keep private take the money from a friend darby and as a mark of esteem for a man thank you my lord replied the inspector straightly i don't deny but what my conscience and my duty to the government will allow me to take it since you put it in that way and as i am not a rich man the money will be welcome thank you with a warm handshake the inspector took his departure and noel offered up a silent prayer of thankfulness to god that things had turned out so admirably his shifty cousin was now dead and there was no longer any danger that the honor of the family for which so much had been sacrificed both by himself and agnes would be smirked the young man regretted the death of mother cockleshell who had been so well disposed toward his wife and himself but he rejoiced that chaldea had left england under the guardianship of kara as henceforth if he knew anything of the dwarf's jealous disposition the girl would trouble him no more and silver was dead and buried which did away with any possible trouble coming from that quarter finally 
poor miss greeby who had sinned for love was out of the way and there was no need to be anxious on her account fate had made a clean sweep of all the actors in the tragedy and lambert hoped that this particular play was ended when the inspector went away lord garvington sought out his wife and his late cousin's widow to them he reported all that had passed and gave them the joyful assurance that nothing more would be heard in connection with the late tragic events both ladies were delighted poor freddie sighed agnes who had quite forgiven her brother now that he had paid for his sins he behaved very badly all the same he had his good points noel ah he had he had said lady garvington the widow shaking her untidy head he was selfish and greedy and perhaps not so thoughtful as he might have been but there are worse people than poor freddie no could not help smiling at this somewhat guarded elegy of the dead but did not pursue the subject well jane you must not grieve too much no i shall not she admitted bluntly i am going to be quiet for a few months and then perhaps i may marry again but i shall marry a man who lives on nuts and roots my dear noel never again she shuddered shall i bother about the kitchen i shall burn freddie's recipes and cookery books lady garvington evidently really felt relieved by the death of her greedy little husband although she tried her best to appear sorry but the twinkle of relief in her eyes betrayed her and neither noel nor agnes could blame her she had enough to live on since the new lord had arranged this in the most generous manner and she was free from the cares of the kitchen so i'll go to london in a few days when i've packed up said the widow nodding you two dears can stay here for your second honeymoon it will be concerned with pounds shillings and pence then said agnes with a smile for noel has to get the estate put in order things are very bad just now as i know for certain but we must try to save the manor from going out of the family it was at this moment and while the trio wondered how the financial condition of the lamberts was to be improved that a message came saying that mr jarwin wished to see lord and lady garvington in the library wondering what the lawyer had come about and dreading further bad news the young couple descended leaving the widow to her packing up they found the lean dry solicitor waiting for them with a smiling face oh said agnes as she greeted him then it's not bad news on the contrary said jarwin with his cough it is the best of news noel looked at him hard the best of news to me at the present moment would be information about money he said slowly i have a title it is true but the estate is much encumbered you need not trouble about that lord garvington mrs stanley has put all that right what asked agnes greatly agitated has she made over the mortgages to noel oh if she only has she has done better than that remarked jarwin producing a paper of no great size this is her will she wanted to make a deed of gift and probably would have done so had she lived but luckily she made the will and a hard and fast one it is for i drew it up myself said mr jarwin complacently how does the will concern us asked agnes catching noel's hand with a tremor for she could scarcely grasp the hints of the lawyer mrs stanley my dear lady had a great regard for you since you nursed her through a dangerous illness also you were as she put it a good and true wife to her grandson therefore as she approved of you and of your second marriage she has left the entire fortune of your late husband to you and to lord garvington here never cried lambert growing pale while his wife gasped with astonishment it is true and here is the proof jarwin shook the parchment one million to you lord garvington and one million to your wife listen if you please 
and the solicitor read the document in a formal manner which left no doubt as to the truth of his amazing news when he finished the lucky couple looked at one another scarcely able to speak it was agnes who recovered her voice first oh it can't be true it can't be true she cried no pinch me for i must be dreaming it is true as the will gives you to understand said the lawyer smiling in his dry way and if i may be permitted to say so lady garvington never was money more rightfully inherited you surrendered everything for the sake of true love and it is only just that you should be rewarded if mrs stanley had lived she intended to give five or six thousand for herself so that she could transport certain gypsies to america but she would undoubtedly have made a deed of gift of the rest of the property oh what a very fortunate thing it was that she made this will cried jarwin genuinely moved at the thought of the possible loss of the millions for her unforeseen death would have spoiled everything if i had not the forethought to suggest the testament it is to you we owe our good fortune to mrs gentilly stanley and to me partially i only ask for my reward that you would continue to allow me to see after the property the fees added jorwin with his dry cough will be considerable you can rob us if you like said noel slapping him on the back well to say that i am glad is to speak weakly i am overjoyed with this money we can restore the fortunes of the family again they will be placed higher than they have ever been before cried agnes with a shining face two millions oh what a lot of good we can do to yourselves inquired jarwin dryly and to others also said lambert gravely god has been so good to us that we must be good to others then be good to me lord garvington said the solicitor putting away the will in his bag for i am dying of hunger a little luncheon a very big one i am no great eater said jarwin and walked toward the door a wash and brush up and a plate of soup will satisfy me and i will say again what i said before to both of you that you thoroughly deserve your good fortune lord garvington you are the luckier of the two as you have a wife who is far above rubies and and dear me i am talking romance so foolish at my age to think well well i am extremely hungry so don't let luncheon be long before it appears and with a croaking laugh at his jokes the lawyer disappeared left alone the fortunate couple fell into one another's arms it seemed incredible that the past storm should have been succeeded by so wonderful a calm they had been tested by adversity and they had proved themselves to be of sterling metal before them the future stretched in a long smooth road under sunny blue skies and behind them the black clouds out of which they had emerged were dispersing into thin air evil passes good endures two millions sighed agnes joyfully of red money remarked her husband why do you call it that mother cockleshell bless her called it so because it was tainted with blood but we must cleanse the stains agnes by using much of it to help all that are in trouble god has been good in settling our affairs in this way but he has given me a better gift than the money what is that asked lady garvington softly the love of my dear wife said the happiest of men to the happiest of women end of chapter twenty one end of red money by fergus hume recording by sharon kilmer san antonio texas